Hey there, folks. Welcome to Spectrum Pulse. You talk about music, movies, art, and culture, and it's my 1,000th video review. Thank you all so much for supporting this channel, and to commemorate the five plus years I've been working, I got something special, so stay tuned to the very end of the video. But now onto the matter at hand. It's a big one. We're going to be talking about the newest album from Travis Scott, Astro World. So I've got conflicted feelings about Travis Scott. I liked him as a producer for his ability to deliver some forward-thinking, massive production. But then Rodeo happened, and while many celebrated it for the wide range of collaborators and his uncanny ability to deliver some terrific hooks, many of the tones and heft that I liked about his previous production work had evaporated, especially around Travis Scott as an MC who could assemble a decent enough, if derivative, flow, but was far from lyrical or all that interesting. Then Birds in the Trap Sing McKnight happened, and contrary to pretty much everybody, I actually like that more than Rodeo. I don't know what to tell you. The production and hooks clicked more strongly for me, the collaborations were certainly more consistent, and while the content was borderline nonsensical at points, it all at least felt a little bit more cohesive. Less experimental or challenging, sure, and that Huncho Jack collab project with Quavo did not help matters, but for the first time ever, the appeal of Travis Scott started to click for me. And then I saw Travis Scott live, opening up for Kendrick Lamar, and what might have clicked before really connected for me here, but also left me with more questions. Travis Scott could be such a force of personality on stage, a consummate hype man with a lot of real charisma, so why he tried to dampen it with so many slurred over layers and effects, or muffle it with overloaded lists of guest stars, that's utterly beyond me. He doesn't need any of it. And that's when I started seeing the critical acclaim piled onto Astroworld. Look, I wasn't sure what to expect at this point, but I did see in the track listing you got Pharrell, The Weeknd, Tame Impala, Stevie Wonder, a lot of them, some even on the same song, so the spectacle might be worth the price of admission here. So alright, what the hell? How is Astro World? Well, honestly, if I was conflicted about Travis Scott before, Astroworld has only further intensified that feeling. Because I really want to like this a lot more than I do. More than ever, it feels like Travis Scott is pushing into more ambitious territory as an artist, and calling in as many favors as he possibly could to deliver a twisted, over-the-top theme park experience. And yet, like your average carnival, you just take one step back, you can see all the cheap seams, the suffocating and sticky atmosphere that smells a little bit too sickly sweet, and you know, in the back of your mind, it's all going to be gone by the end of the summer, and you'll be wondering how much you really got out of that experience, especially in the long term. And what gets kind of awkward about all that is the sneaking suspicion that Travis Scott isn't really playing to his strengths with this project, particularly in his delivery. Sure, it's as slathered and warping autotune as ever, and the worship of Kid Cudi is as blatant as ever, but if you're coming here looking for the huge bangers that can make Travis Scott's personality swell up so effectively live and deliver on stage, it's strangely muted here, with him once again slipping closer to the curator role and twisting his plentiful guest stars towards his artistic vision, where Travis Scott often winds up feeling like a guest vocal presence on a lot of his own songs. Now granted, some of this is a natural consequence of the record feeling as woozy and drug-addled as it is. If it's meant to cultivate the feeling of being like a passenger of one's own life and mind warping around you, it definitely gets there. But if you're expecting there to be a sense of momentum or edge or a feeling that Travis Scott's got any clear idea idea where he's taking any of this, by the time you get to the back half of the album, that feeling is utterly gone, and the atmosphere starts to slip away as well, and some of the verisimilitude just pushes me out of the album. Now, a big part of this ties back to the content, and yes, we'll be coming back to this, but no matter how many layers of autotune that Travis Scott piles on to make so many other artists sound like him on this record, this choice not to become a more assertive presence behind the microphone means that other voices unfortunately become more prominent than him. Frank Ocean's deep hook on Carousel, not quite my thing, but it's at least a little bit more distinctive. I've heard this from Frank Ocean before, as is Drake's frequently frustrating performance on the choppy song Sicko Mo. Come on, Brian Mo taking half a Xan to sleep on the plane? That's a sort of painfully basic reference point I'd expect from Lil Dicky, not you, Drake, even coming off a of Scorpion. But the problem here, it's sadly endemic. Will you be remembering anything that Travis Scott is saying on Stop Trying to Be God? Or are you going to remember Stevie Wonder's harmonica, followed by an absolutely beautiful beautiful bridge coming from James Blake. Will you care more about Tame Impala's synthesizers opposite The Weeknd on Skeletons? Or Travis Scott's cum-stained double entendres? Will 
be Travis Scott pitching his voice even higher into a really unpleasant tone on NC-17, or 21 Savage actually being compelling for once behind the microphone. I actually kind of like this verse. Of course, the big asterisk here is always how well his guest stars deliver, and it's already become a bit of a meme how badly layered Nav's vocals were on Yosemite on the outro, but what annoyed me more here is how John Mayer's guitar work and Thundercat's bass were mixed into mush on Astro Thunder, when for some ungodly reason, the badly tuned strumming that dominated Wake Up, it sounds like a cast off from Tentacion, even as The Weeknd desperately tries to add some sort of smoother groove amidst the ocean of autotune, it, it only barely works. But you know what? This surrounds the question about what vibe Travis Scott was even looking to pursue in the first place with a lot of this production. The murkier trap bass grooves, they're of course dominant, you would expect that from him. But Travis Scott's choice of melodic tones tends to be a little bit more jagged and scattered here. From the faint synthesizers coloring the background without a lot of driving melody to push the song, to flashes of more organic instrumentation that move to the forefront and can't help but feel a little bit discordant and clipped among a mix as swamped out as it is, with songs like Skeleton ends and the borderline boom bap against the chopped up guitar and coffee beam, showing more than a few glimpses towards Kanye West's general direction. And when this project's able to leverage more of those organic, guitar-driven melodies, I gotta be honest, I actually think the album develops some real personality outside of the desaturated trap mire that drips over so much of this project and that we've heard from Travis Scott so many times before. Hell, many have criticized it as the moment where the record takes a serious downturn, but I actually like 5% Tint with the rinky-dink pianos, the frail, whirring clicks, the odd gargling laugh of what sounds like a fraud or a toad, maybe even bits of a hair dryer going through there, and then the misty swell of the outro that's genuinely gorgeous. It's one of the few points where the album captures that haunted carnival vibe that it's trying to cultivate, and it's certainly more distinctive than when the record defaults to the by-the-numbers mid-tempo trap songs, or when it shoves the overexposed butterfly effect on the track listing, likely just to juice up the album's streaming numbers for certification in the upcoming weeks on the Billboard 200. Hell, I certainly prefer to the multi beat switches on sicko mode, trying to find some sort of tone that works for the song, but it highlights arguably the two biggest problems with the album as a whole, the momentum and the atmosphere. The only song that comes close to having any sort of tempo or punch is No Bystanders, where Juice World is brought in for some higher accent points and for once he's tolerable, and then you get Sheck West delivering a hook that I actually kind of liked as an interpolation of some old southern songs, but beyond that, this record just settles into murky, low-key, mid-tempo trap songs, which would probably work a lot better if the instrumental tones blended and didn't lead to a lot of whiplash transitions, both within the songs themselves and between them. The album's not really sequenced all that well either. And then we get to the content. And look, even Travis Scott's fans, they will acknowledge he's not a lyricist. And as such, it's hard to avoid the brand name porn, the rampant drug abuse, the taking of your girl, and the bleary-eyed moments that are passing for self-reflection, if only barely. And you know what? If Travis Scott was just cranking out bangers, that could have worked. But slowing things down and showing Travis Scott rapping more than ever draws more attention to his content, to the writing, and the feeling that his inability to fully articulate a distinctive idea compromises both the atmosphere and any deeper sense of actual reflection. And even then, avoiding the landmine of R.I.P. G.J. Screw, or despite the late producer's overdose depth, the drug abuse only seems to be slowing down and not stopping on the song, it's hard to get a handle on where any of this could actually lead. There's whole tracks dedicated to celebrating the long dormant Houston scene in hip-hop, and how much Travis Scott wants to resurrect the hazy fantasy of Astro World from his childhood, implying some sort of desperate escape that's always been the uneasy subtext and the melancholy of his darkest songs and his drug abuse, but there's little introspection beyond fragmented hints of dejected humility on Stop Trying to Be God, and Paranoia that actually does some atmospheric heavy lifting across the midsection of the album. And while there are references to systemic racism and even a conversation he had with Bill Clinton on Houston fornication, it's kind of fleeting at best. We're not seeing any depth going on here. Hell, the one reason that I actually like Coffee Bean as an album closer, it's a return to some caffeinated reality, where he gets frank about his expectations surrounding his relationship with Kylie Jenner, which he expects may well be doomed in the long term. He even walks through the divorce court proceedings in the second verse due to some of that distance in their professional lives, her family's concerns about his reputation, and his own depressive melancholy. Hell, you get the impression that this album is just him looking for that desperate escape to childhood, but even he knows deep down that despite all of his success, which he will celebrate all the more, he just can never quite get that back. 
and a little bit more introspection in that vein really could have set this album apart. But of course, a lot of this is conjecture, partially because Astroworld isn't particularly interested in being coherent or structured. It's a hazy wallow and shallow opulence trying to recapture a very lost dream, and yet without much momentum or consistency, it's a tough record for me to truly recommend. Even if I do think this is the sort of album that Travis Scott had to make at some point and move forward and advance as an artist. Of course, the diehard fans, they've been heralding this as best yet, and really... It's kind of tough to say for me, but I'm giving an extremely light 6 out of 10 and a recommendation for more of that crowd. Everybody else, not sure it's got the widespread appeal to really click long term, even if it's going to dominate Billboard Breakdown in the coming weeks, but it's an interesting lesson all the same, so yeah, go ahead, check it out. So yeah, thanks a lot for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I'd be more than grateful. Yeah, it's been a thousand reviews. I'm really appreciative of all that. But hey, for this particular album, you want to buy it, link's down there below. And I got the poll up there for y'all to tell me how wrong I am, which I kind of expect given how much critical acclaim this record has gotten. Beyond that, if you guys want to get involved in supporting this channel or helping vote things up my schedule, link to my Patreon is right over there, where three times a week you guys get to vote for my schedule, and once a week for the higher tier contributors, you guys get to add albums, movies, or even a top 10 list to that schedule. More details right there. You want to see my schedule, it's linked down there below. But also what's linked down there below is two things that I've decided to really commemorate the past five plus years I've been working on this channel. There are two playlists attached to my Spotify profile that I've now made public. One of these playlists contains every song, well not every song, contains all the best songs on all the albums that I have covered that is available on Spotify. So no, there's no Lemonade, there's not my favorite song out of 2015 because Jason Mercury didn't put it there, but whatever. There's well over a thousand songs because I'm including albums I covered on the trailing edge there as well. So it goes pretty long. That's the thousand B list. The 1000W list is a little different. It is a compiled list of all the worst songs that I have ever covered on my channel. That's right, over a thousand of them. I did the full curation, I built that list of all the worst songs that I have covered. And here's my challenge to you guys if you guys want to get involved in the YouTube reaction game here. Try to make it through one of the lists. I think the worst list is the real meaty challenge. Have to listen to it in order. Have to put it up, the video up online. Love to see how far you guys get in. Because I reckon most of you guys won't get past like song 10 or 11. And really, I couldn't blame you. It's a real ugly scene there. But it's not all terrible songs. Keep in mind, I've covered great albums. I don't have a lot of terrible songs. But yeah, I'd like to see if you guys get involved there. But hey, until then, thanks a lot for having me for this long, for a thousand reviews. See if I have enough in me for a thousand more. Until then, I'm Mark, you're watching Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next time.